it is a huge honor today to be podcast interviewing a leader, mentor, role model of mine since way back in the day. I mean, it's you, you, you signed up on Dental Town in 2001. Um, yeah. Mike Dolby, are you in a relation to the Thomas Dolby where she's saying, he's saying she blinded me with science? Is that, Zero. Is that your, you're, you're, you're going to blind us with practice science? Cousin. Right? Thomas Dolby will blind you with science and Mike Dolby will blind, will, uh, blinded you with practice management advice. Dr. Dolby entered the field of dentistry in a somewhat unorthodox fashion. A scholarship athlete at Boise State University led to a degree in business management. Straight out of college, working as a sales representative for a consumer products company, he knew there had to be a more rewarding profession. He decided to attend the University of the Pacific School of Dentistry in San Francisco, where he graduated with high honors. He went on to further his dental education, being selected to participate in a general practice residency at St. Joseph's Hospital in Denver, Colorado. In 2001, he was awarded his fellowship by the American Academy of General Dentistry. In 1994, he entered private practice and established Harrison Dental in Boise, Idaho. And in 2007, started <clears throat> Cottonwood Creek Dental in Eagle, Idaho. Dr. Dolby was honored to be a featured instructor at the Pacific Aesthetic Continuum Pack Live where he taught dentists the most effective practice management strategies for their practice. He also partnered up with the self-improvement expert Tony Robbins and Fortune Management to become a dental practice management coach. These experiences opened his eyes to the significant lack of business training that most dentists have, leaving them at a distinct disadvantage when it comes to running their practice. In 2015, Dr. Dolby started Triumph Dental in order to provide dentists a, a clear path to owning their private practice while obtaining the business education to properly operate a stress-free, profitable dental practice. Triumph Dental secures established, fee-for-service, single-doctor practices and personally teaches candidates everything they need to know to operate a successful and profitable dental practice. And in just 36 months, 100% of the practice ownership is transferred to the new doctor. The most predictable path to a successful dental career. That is just amazing. How are you doing, buddy? Good, good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Oh, man. And, and by the way, he doesn't want to talk about this because he's too humble, but this guy was such an athlete. He actually tried out for the 49ers, and they start with like 150 people. He made several cuts. He damn near made the team in 1987. Because when I met you in 87, I, the first thing I thought was, damn, you must be a professional. I mean, you, you, in 87, you, you, you look like you played for the NFL. Well, back then I did. I was about 30 pounds heavier here, and uh, now, you know, not a dentist. I got the dentist body now. I've slimmed down. Thank God. So what position were you trying for? I was inside linebacker. So, so we just, I just, uh, before we, before we go, uh, before we go on, I just have to ask, uh, I, I just want to say one thing on the NFL. It's, um, it's my crazy indulgence. I mean, it uh -huh. makes no sense. I just completely love it. Good. And I, um, I make fun of people who don't like, um, their, their sister, or their wife watching a reality TV show because, I think reality TV show is smarter than the NFL because I have no idea why I want the Cardinals to beat the 49ers. But when I'm watching reality TV, I know why Mary's mad at Shawanda. Okay, I, I don't, I don't know why what the uh, the Arizona Cardinals. And I'm so glad I'm not a gambling person because I think I'm so smart in the NFL. And I would have bet my car that the Carolina Panthers would oh, have destroyed me too. Denver. Me too, too, me too. And I had that bet all day long, and I don't know what happened. I mean. To think that uh, Carolina could win every game in the regular season and not have an answer for uh, Denver's defense was beyond me. They were at a loss, uh, a complete loss. It I, blew me away. I was just, I was just dumbfounded. I, yeah. I, I loved the game just because I was thinking, I don't have any money on this game. Because, yeah. <laughs> because every time I know it's a gimme in the NFL, something yeah. goes horribly wrong, and oh, I would have lost a ton oh. of money. So, yeah. so um, you got out of school in um, – what year did you get out? You got out in 93? Uh, 93 at dental school, yeah, then did my residency, I was done with that in 94. And I got out in 87. So my, my first question is, uh, Mike, do you, do you think the business of dentistry climate has changed from when we got out, out 25 years ago as opposed to the kids getting out in 2016? What What's different about 2016 than back in the day? Well, I think back in the day, um, dentists were uh, – the, the business of dentistry was a lot more lax. Um, you could still be – pretty successful and you could be doing a lot of little things wrong in your practice, meaning that you didn't have to run a super efficient office and most dentists made enough money to meet their needs. So they didn't, they didn't care about managing their practice. It didn't really matter. 
Well, today that landscape has incredibly changed. You know, with uh, you know decreasing reimbursement rates, the you know the uh, we didn't have practice. I, I didn't have uh, we didn't really have corporate dentistry when we first started. Now we do, and so we have all this much more competition out there uh, for those dental dollars. That it makes you so you have to pay attention to this. Um, guys have to. Um, learn practice management. They have to know how to run a business. And the way the landscape is set up now, it's it's really really tough. I mean, we got dental students coming out of dental school, you know, two three hundred thousand dollars, four hundred thousand dollars in some cases in debt. And we ask them to run a small business. Um, we might as well be asking them to do facelifts because they have had no training in that also. Um, so it, you know, the landscape has definitely changed. You have to know what you're doing. You cannot just wing it anymore or expect your office manage, manager who you inherited through the previous practice know how to run the practice. So, uh, yeah, you've got to follow some very basic fundamentals in business. It's not that hard to learn. It's just, unfortunately, um, our industry has not taken the time or effort to focus on that. It's all after the fact. We're trying so hard to learn the clinical aspects of it that uh, we often let the practice management or the running of our biz- dental business uh, go by the wayside. You know, um, I, I, I think one of the most amazing changes uh, in the last 25 years is when we got out, um, we, we had that cost plus profit strategy where you took your cost, you added your profit, you write at your price, you submitted your price to all the insurance companies, and they say, okay, that's your price, and we'll pay 80% of a filling, half of a you know crown, whatever. Now, the insurance companies all say, no, no, now we've moved to a market um, a market price strategy uh, uh, or, or a, market, uh, um, a market minus strategy where here's your price for a crown. Now you got to subtract your profit. You got to arrive at a budget, and I, I don't. I don't think. Uh, I. I think just going to from cost plus profit equals submit your price to insurance. They pay a percent. To now it's all here's your damn price, and if you sure. want to make any profit, subtract it. Now you have a budget, and I. I don't think the dentists get that because there's there's still lost in this, um, in this deal where I want to do the best dentistry. It's like well you're the the price isn't for the best dentistry. I mean you want to make a Mercedes, but you're getting paid for a Chevy. Do you think that's a factor? It absolutely is a factor. Um, I mean, we have to consider that. So that even, so if we have limited ways we can charge, our fee structure is already predetermined by the insurance companies. Then, they, then you're going to decide what type of insurance companies you want to be in business with, uh, so you can get the maximum return. But yeah, since you have that limit, now the only other way you're going to squeeze the efficiency of, of your profitability is to maximize every system in your practice so that it is as efficient and profitable as possible. If you're not doing that, then it, it, you're just watching your overhead go crazy, and we're seeing that with guys. I mean, I'm seeing practices I'm working with, you know, 60, I mean, 75, 80% overheads and not figuring out why they're not making any money. Yeah, and, and you know what? Um, something that's really um – Creeping me out is, um, you know, a couple of years ago, gas was $100 a barrel, I mean oil, and it plummeted right. to 30 and there was really no change in production. So, you know, demand dropped out, and it had to be somewhere big like Asia, Latin America. So, you, so that, that was scary. Then the China market starts to devalue, and then the American stock market's down about 18%. But, but that's all the, – the stock market's kind of like teenagers. They're emotional, sure. but the right. bond market is deteriorating. Right, and right, right. The, the, I remember my MBA professor in economics in, um, at ASU used to say, uh, um, when the bond market deteriorates, it predicts a recession nine out of every five times. Yep. <laughs> and, and I'm in Phoenix, and this is just February 10th. There's already been 10 dental offices in the Phoenix Valley that have gone bankrupt. In the new year, 2016. Yeah, isn't, that, see, isn't that crazy? Ten. So that's a big. That's a, when you go back to your original question. You know, we first started practicing. Uh, that's something we never saw. We never. I never knew a guy went out of business. You know, I never knew a dentist go out going bankrupt. And that's a reality today. But that's the increased uh, uh, dental school costs, the increased uh, uh, in, uh, entry fee into this profession, um, and then the uh, restricted uh, uh, reimbursement rates. I mean, and then with the lack of practice management, you put on top of that. God, it's amazing. Anybody succeed, really. Okay, okay. go into specifics. You, you started this uh, – you, you came out with your new book. Um, and well, first of all, you came out with an online C course on Dental Town. That was amazing. If you haven't watched uh, my Practice Made Perfect online C course on Dental Town, it came out um, 
Oh, no, it's available March 2016. Right, right. Yeah. I, have to, I have not done with it yet, but I'm, I'm almost uh, almost done with it. But you came out with the uh, the book this year, um, yeah. Practice Made Perfect. That that was the impetus for making this course. Um, discuss um, Practice Made Perfect, Blueprint for a Successful Dental Practice. Um, yeah. You started your website, your business, Triumph. Hyphen Dental, is that called? Is that, is yeah, that Triumph. Yeah, triumph dental 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 com. What yeah. exactly are you doing? Well, you know, First off, I wrote the book for one simple reason. I had so many dentists that I run across on a daily basis asking, what do I do? How do what, they all want to know the secret sauce. They want to know that one key ingredient. And they all think it's new, new, new patients or more patients. Um, so I wanted to put down everything I had learned in the last 20 years um, into print so somebody could actually have that as a resource, um, a, a guideline, and no different than the books you've written and the CE courses you've offered and so forth, getting that information out there so they can apply it. And some they'll apply and some they won't. You know, I just wanted to have a resource for them to do that. Um, so that was the whole premise of the book. And it was one of those things that, uh, as you know, writing a book takes about uh, 10 times longer than you think it's going to take. And uh, by the time you get to finishing it um, <laughs> or reviewing it, there you, you go back to a chapter you written last, written last year, and then you had to rewrite the whole darn thing. But, um, you know, I was able to get that uh, checked off the list and completed, and it's, uh, it's been a relatively good success. Um, had a lot of people have a great positive comments from the book. You can get it on Amazon. Um, and it's, it's been wonderful, easy read, uh, inexpensive way to tap into what's been so profitable for me for the last 20, 21 years um, in this business. Um, Triumph Dental was created out of the uh, need to want to give dentists, young dentists, an opportunity to avoid associateships that just don't work, um, corporate dentistry that they're just not happy being in because they're just working, uh, you know, their fannies off and so forth or being told what to do. So I wanted to create some sort of platform for dentists who had a strong desire to own their own practice but obviously didn't know the practice management uh, to be able to be able to operate their own practice or have the financial needs to do that and get them into a practice. So what I do is I go out and find great private uh, single doctor practices and I take great clients um, and merge them into that practice. We handle everything from uh, the conception of finding, negotiating the purchase price, uh, help with financing, um, and once we get them into that practice, we handle the transition from the old, from the senior doctor to the new doctor, which is key. I've seen practices lose 60% of their patient base or their goodwill because that transition was done so poorly. Um, so we handle that. We integrate a, a, a great team around them and start implementing our business systems tools um, that uh, I have all in the book, and we create a great solid foundation. So now this young dentist doesn't have to spend four or five years making one mistake after the next. He can go into this practice, have somebody holding his hand, but teaching him, so I'm not a lifelong partner with him, and, uh, you know, in 36 months, he's got his own practice, and we can be there to answer any, you know, questions that come up and whatnot, but it's the quickest way, the most efficient, profitable way for a young guy to have a, 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 a stream, streamlined path to practice ownership. Now, so you're finding a dentist selling a practice, so you're yes. you're, you're buying uh, your uh, 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 transition. So some older person is selling their practice, right. and you're helping that person find someone to buy the practice, and then right. you're gonna um, have a program to watch and educate this this person on a three year transition to full ownership. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And, and when you go into these school, is that are you recruiting straight out of dental school, or do you like them to have five years' experience out of dental school? How, uh, you know, it just depends. It depends. Off? It's it's all on an application process because we're asking dentists to. I'm looking for guys that are have an entrepreneurial spirit or hungry that just want some guidance. So that could person be coming out of a general practice residency. It could be coming out of the military, so he's got three or four years' experience, or it might be a real uh, overachiever coming right out of dental school and just wants to get into it. So it really depends. Depends on the person. I see a lot of guys come out that just don't want to do that. They want to work for corporate dentistry. They want to punch a, uh, a, a, the, the time clock every day and leave and never have any responsibilities. And that's fine too. That's not what we do. But that's uh, there, there's you know there's General Dentals and Heartland and all those guys that can service that client very well. And what what percent of the dental school graduates you think want just an eight to five job at corporate versus how many of them want their own uh, show? 
You know, it's a, that's an interesting thing. I think the majority of dentists go into dental school with the thought of owning their own practice. They see their general dentist that they grew up with, have his name on the door, have his brick-and-mortar building, and have his team, and they kind of want that. I think that's the vision they have in their mind. When they go through everything that dental school has to teach them in regards to the didactics and the clinical aspects of dentistry, sometimes that can be overwhelming, and then they go out and are expected to open their own practice. Since they don't have that business knowledge, I'd say a fair amount of them end up drifting towards corporate dentistry for no other means other than financial because they have such a debt uh, burden on them. Um, but I think the majority want to have their own practice, and then they finally migrate back after Four, three, four, five years in corporate world um, or an associateship that just never panned out, and they want to look, start looking for their own practice. So I still think the majority do want that. Um, I think about 20% want to just punch the clock, um, but I think the, probably the majority uh, do want their own private practice. Well, you know, this is Dentistry Uncensored, and I am known for sometimes saying things that aren't so politically correct, but I, would, I, I tell these older guys that when they're still in a practice, and my 30-year observation – you said that you want them to have an entrepreneurial spirit and hungry. Sure. I, th I think a hunger is a bigger thing. When I see these kids walk out of school, their dad was a dentist that paid for dental school. They're single. They want to leave at 5 o'clock. They're hitting the bars in Scottsdale. They're trying to find hot dates on Match.com, whatever. <laughs> and I go back the last 30 years. It's the Mormons who come out of school married with two kids. They don't have 300,000 debt. They got 500,000 debt. And they are so focused and so hungry, they'll open up a practice and work 7 to 7 Monday through Saturday without blinking for a decade. Yeah, and right. I, 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 would, I would put my money on five hungry coyotes that a rabbit's going to get killed than mm -hmm. a couple lazy fat coyotes walking out there having a beer and a cigarette. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think that, the hunger. I think you're, you're spot on, and, and we work with a lot of LDS dentists because of that factor. And we, and, and we see it in the student loan default rate. No one's talking about the biggest story. Do you realize the more debt you have, the default rate is inversely correlated? It's sure. the small people in debt of ten or 20000 that are defaulting. But once you have a hundred or two hundred or $300,000 student loans, there's almost no default rate because that person was laser focused. They knew sure. there was a reason they were taking out that much money and they got a sure. plan. It's, sure. a, it's sure. a kid 20000 in debt who never really had a plan and doesn't know what they're doing. Right, exactly. But, but, I, but if I was going to sell a practice, I want hungry. I want hungry, hungry. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, it doesn't do I, – I, you know, I want to – if I'm going to share somebody the knowledge I have in practice management and teach you how to run a business, I want you to be hungry and learn how to run that business. I don't want you to have me doing everything for you because that doesn't serve you at all. I mean, the, the most profitable, most – um, uh, it, it, you know, efficient you can be is only your own practice. I mean, when you have that tax structure and you have that business under your belt, I mean, there's the, that, that's the best you can do in our in our world of dentistry. So, you know, we've spent we spend way too much time and effort and cost to become a dentist to work for somebody else. Uh, in my opinion, I think that I, that I would want to uh, kind of be the director of my own path. Oh, my God. You know, my dad never gave me a dime. You know, I, I graduated $87,000 student loans back in 87, which I think real and constant dollars is about 250 today. Man, it'd be 5 o'clock. We'd be closing the house. At 2, they would walk in. We'd knock out the root canal building. We'd kind of leave at 7 and thought we were lucky. We thought we were lucky <laughs> that someone came in and bumped my, bump my dinner for two that. hours. I hit that. I, I, I cannot. I can't even tell you in '94 what I paid for my first practice because I just wanted a place to go. I just wanted a business that I knew because I knew I was gonna just take it off. But I needed a foundation, and once I got it, it, I just took off with it. And you know, I was working seven days a week. And if I wasn't working treating patients, I was working on the business, and it was constant. It was all I thought about for just like you said for ten years. And, uh, you know, it, it was, you know, learned a lot along the way and uh, had, had tremendous success. But it comes to that work ethic that you just can't teach. They better have some of that uh, ingrained in them from the get-go. So what, um, so when, when you transfer this dental office, um, go, go through the big questions. I mean, num number one, um, you know, I, I still think the debt's overrated. I mean, when they come up to me and say they're $400,000 in student loan debt, I'm like, well, you know, God, in Phoenix, 20% of the homes cost over 400000 If I walked into any of those $400,000 homes and said, hey, would you trade your home for a, doctor, a, a doctorate yeah, degree? Right, right, right. Most people would say, hell yeah, I'm a plumber. Uh, yeah, I'll take yeah, it. So right. the $400,000 of student loans is pretty silly, especially when their first divorce will cost a million dollars or $2 million or $3 million. <laughs> um, but, 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 the, but the next thing I want to go is the big toys. So 
your $400,000 student loans, and now society's telling you you need a $150,000 CERAC machine, a $100,000 CBCT, a $75,000 BioLace laser. Do you think those three big toys are a must-have return on investment, or is that not really part of the factor of being successful? Yeah, I'm glad this is dinner three on Sunset because I'm going to probably say some things that are going to piss people off. Because Awesome. Um, <laughs> awesome. I, Let me turn I, up the volume. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, – uh, those – you know, I, I bet you uh, the, the guys that you saw go out of practice down in Phoenix for next year in Abutuki and, and the guys I see in Boise and some of the other areas are going bankrupt. I walk into those businesses and I walk into those practices and all of them have that exactly. They've got a CEREC, they've got a comb beam, they've got all these toys um, that – it, that have caused them to do that. I mean, these sales reps come out and they give them these dollar buyout leases. The guys don't even know what the hell they're signing. And before you know it, they have this unbelievably well-furnished office that it should be the office of a guy who's doing, who's been in practice 15 or 20 years because he has earned his right to have those toys. Um, Sarek and some of the, uh, the, the those type of, of technology are great, but not from day one. Not from day one at all. And it's very difficult to get CAD CAM dentistry to be profitable in most practices. And I'm going to tell you why. Because there's not a paradigm shift when they go out and spend $120,000, $130,000 for this machine. They just get it as a new toy. When it has to be a complete paradigm shift where now we are a CAD CAM practice. And you're going to invest the time and energy to train your team so that you can make this thing work and you can get the ROI to be positive. I, 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 I scratch my head in, in just amazement when I hear guys saying, um, I, I, I got a brand new 84, I got a brand new CERC, and I take an impression, I pour it up after everybody goes home, and I do the lab work uh, to, till, you know, what, 10 o'clock at night, and then I come back in the next day and I cement the crown. I'm like, why in the hell would you do that? Now you're a, a very low-paid lab tech, and when you were a very highly paid dentist, why would, why would you do that? So. Uh, there, there are some things with the, that technology that I think you can work into practices. And don't get me wrong, I love that technology. I love all the advancements. But there has to be a plan, a very strategic plan in place when you're going to implement that type of expensive technology in your practice. So I think bread and butter dentistry is what we all do. I think there's very few dentists out there that do cosmetics or some sort of specialty. You know, I'm a dentist who makes, you know, I do, a, I would say I do a lot of cosmetic dentistry and it's about 20% of what I do. Could I survive off that? Off that? Hell no. I've got to be able to do the, the, the root canals, the, the dentures, the crown, of, I got to be able to do it all. And that's what dentists have to be able to really master. Do I need a, 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 a $150,000 CAD CAM machine to do that? No. Now, in year five, six, and I'm doing really well, and I've really trained my team, and I want to implement that technology, absolutely. But you need help to show you how that piece of equipment could be profitable for you. So with all those, they kind of group them all together. So hopefully I, I didn't piss off Shine or Patterson or any of those guys. But, but who cares? Who cares? They're not going to pay your student loans. I mean, who cares uh, about Patterson and Shine and all, all those guys? Thing? I mean, yeah, they I, said I, that. Yeah, they signed that lease, and now you're out of business, and you have this nice, shiny uh, CERIC machine sitting in the corner. You don't have any patience. I mean, what good is that? I'd rather take that dollars I'm going to do and spend it on a marketing campaign and really get patients in the door. But but it's that herd mentality because the herd of dentists in 1950 averaged under 50% overhead, and now the herd of dentists in 2000 was north of two-thirds, 65%. Yep. So the whole herd added 15% overhead. And it's, it's like they go out of their way. It's like, well, what are you doing now? Well, uh, you know, I used to – I used to prep the tooth and take an impression with Emperor gum, but I figured out I could buy a $35,000 scanner and scan the tooth, and then only a few labs take it, and then I have to buy all this software and HIPAA, and, 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 I, and I went to all these courses, and I figured out how to have to buy a $35,000 piece of debt and yeah. raise my overhead five more points. Like, dude, that's going to work for you? You yeah. figured out how to raise your overhead? You know what I think the reason that comes from, which, uh, which I find is very interesting, when you and I went to dental school, we were required to do our own lab work. And because we were required to do our own lab work, we started with the ground level product. We had to create the foundation for this prep, say we're doing a crown. Then I had to take it from there, and I had to take it in the lab, pour it up, and I had to do a very good job doing that so I could trim a great dye so I could make a good crown. If I didn't have every step in place when it came time to see that crown, I, it, it wasn't going to work. So what happens at dental school, a lot of these kids aren't even doing their own lab work. 
So they're just taking a pressure and setting it off so they don't even know what the foundation's supposed to look like. So they get frustrated when their lab sends back crowns that don't fit. So they think the answer is, well, I'll take a scanner because my impressions are bad. Or, and so they're going down the wrong path. You know, I say the, the, the biggest thing we can do in our practices is what I call the three stages of clinical efficiency. And those three stages of clinical efficiency are focus. Because what we focus on is what we get, okay? So you want more new patients, focus on new patients. You want a more profitable practice, focus on how to be profitable. Uh, you want uh, your treatment times to be shorter, more efficient, focus on that, okay? Then we get into organization, second phase. Because you have to be very organized. Things have to have a pattern when you go through your treatment plan, okay? And probably the biggest thing is know your outcome. Because if you don't know when that prep is done, and you don't know when, we just dibble, dabble, dibble, dabble, dibble, dabble, and an hour goes by, hour and a half goes by to do that crown, and we finally stop because we ran out of time. That's not the way to do it. So you, you stack all those in a row, and you have now, now you have true efficiency, and uh, you can start reducing that overhead from that 65% down to, you know, a healthy 55%. I don't really see uh, many practices, I know, you know, reimbursement rates have gone by uh, or down, but... You know, to have a, an overhead at 55, 57 percent is not it's not uncommon. I mean, that that could be that's a that's a true goal. If you don't get tied into all the to tools, you're efficient and you spend some time doing the things you need to do in your practice to make it efficient. So we we talked about um, overhead and the big toys, but the biggest overhead is labor. What what sure. what advice would you give to someone listening? Who says you know, I think my labor is too high. Uh, uh, how, how can you have low overhead if you have high labor? Talk, talk about. Uh, what what should labor costs be? And when you're going into a practice, what 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 makes it uh, too high for you? And how do you address it? What what do you think is going on with the largest expense? And basically, the entire S and P 500 labor is the number one cost. Labor is huge. I mean, we have the t the big three of overhead is going to be you know team compensation, dental supplies, and lab. That's going to constitute 75 percent of your overhead right there, um, or three quarters of it at least. Uh, so you know, with with your team compensation, um, I can give you some percentages, but that doesn't really matter. If, I, if I've got a, if I have, a, if I have a dentist and he has a, one front office, one assistant, one hygienist, and his overhead is 35% for your team compensation, well, he's not overstaffed. He's just underproducing for the staff he has. So we had to teach him how, how to actually become a better producer, more efficient in that aspect of it. Because there's nobody to let go at that point. You know, I, I'm always <laughs> scratching my head when a dentist will let their um, highly skilled, the only other profit or, or the only other um, uh, income source in your practice is your hygienist, they'll let them go and start doing their own hygiene. I scratch my head and go, what are you doing? Um, because I don't know about you, but I, if, I, if I'm left to scale a tooth, it's going to be a, a pretty crappy job. Um, so team compensa compensation, if it's a very well-ran practice, I can tell you this. I run, I have uh, one front office, uh, one dental assistant, and two hygienists that share time. And, uh, you know, in three days, we'll do a million five in gross production and on and, and in three days, three days a week. So we're not. This is your not, practice? This you? is my personal practice. This allows me the time. And to, that's in uh, Eagle, Idaho? Yes. Yeah. And it's right. That, it's right north of that potato field. <laughs> well, of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I love Idaho. I, I, I'm Irish, man. I can't get enough potatoes. So you have three days a week, one point five million a year. And your staff was what? Uh, four people. Four people. What are they? I have a front office, one dental assistant, and two hygienists. Holy gamoly. That should be that should be a, a reality TV show. You just have live cameras in there. We'll just play it on Dental Town. You know what, Howard? I'm not doing anything special. I, I would never claim that anything is anything. How many, how many, doing... how many operatories? Uh, four. Four operatories. So you have a hygienist in room one, then you have two a rooms. hygienist in room two. Oh, you have two hygienists. Two hygienists. Two hygienists. Two hygienists in room one and two, and then you work two chairs, three and four. Yeah. How am I going to work more than that? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I mean, and, and, and you're doing it three days a week. What are your, what are your hours those three days a week? I work uh, eight to eight to six. Eight to six. So that's uh, how many hours is that? That's uh, ten. Ten hour day. Ten hour day. Do you take an hour lunch? Uh, not usually. But I take about a half hour. So I, I would say on average by the time we get out of here, we're working anywhere from 32 to 34 hours a week. Wow. So you just knock out 30, a 34 hour, a 30 hour work week in Monday, but Tuesday, see, Wednesday. The reason, Is it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Yep. So I took a little time on my day to come meet with And you. what would your overhead on that be? 
It's 56%. 56%. You are the man. No, I'm not. And this is why this is why you turned down that contract for the 49ers to be their quarterback next year. <laughs> no, I was trying to get my head bashed in. You know, back when back when I played, we didn't have a word for concussion. It was just you got your bell rung. So who knows how many I've had? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, and that movie flop too uh, with uh, concussion. Just, with yeah, I'm I'm surprised because that was a darn good movie. But oh just, uh, yeah, okay. So, so, so overhead, you know, I'm looking at anywhere from. You know, 20% to 25%, you can keep that. That's a well-ran team. Um, but, again, it comes down to the big, the quickest way, as you and I both know, to lower overhead is increase your sales, increase collections. You start, you know, you get past that threshold and everything starts coming way down. I've had months where my old, my team composition has been down to 14 15%, but, you know, we did 150000 that month. So, you know, it what, just what's your What's your lab and supplies percent on that? My lab, I like to keep it 10 to 12 percent, and supplies 5 to 6 percent. And are you doing that with a, a CERAC CAD CAM? No, no, no. no. Uh, uh, a I laser? Just, I have a laser. We have a laser in hygiene, yeah. I mean a low-cost diode laser or a high-cost yes. $75,000 nope. bio lace? No, nope. diode laser. Okay, so that, that's uh, – yeah, I don't really – I mean that's a laser, but I mean that's a low-cost. And supplies yeah. 5 to 6. Yeah. So the reason I have not – you know, CERAC I just spoke about because – I, at this stage of my career, I'm not willing to change my whole practice philosophy around that. You know, I've been practicing 21 years. I'll probably practice another 10, but I, I it just I haven't gone into that. I still think I still think as great as that technology is, there's still a pretty big learning curve. Um, but uh, uh, you know, it's just something I just haven't introduced, and things are working well, so I, I've just left it alone. And, and another question I always ask is, uh, uh, do you own your building? Do you rent your building? What are your thoughts on own versus rent? I know there's a lot of different opinions on that, and uh, you know I've read several different articles on that. And um, I've uh, I've owned two dental practices in my career. Um, the first one I started, as you mentioned in the in the, in the uh, intro, was Harrison Dental. I started that, or bought, purchased that in '94. Uh, took that over for a gentleman. We got that up, uh, you know, practice very very well. At that same time, I was. I had started doing my practice management coaching with Fortune Management, Tony Robbins Group, and uh, I ended up selling that practice in 2007. And one of the greatest things is I kept ownership of the building. So, um, and when I opened my, when I bought this practice, Cottonwood Creek Dental that I'm in now, I bought that in 2007 from a dentist. Unfortunately, it was going out of business because he didn't run it very well. And we've taken that business, and as I've shared with you the numbers, and um, yes, I've owned both buildings in both situations. Personally, I think it depends on your market, okay? It depends on your market. With the market in Idaho, it completely makes sense to own your own building. If I'm going to be in the, sitting in the same building for 20 years, I want to own that thing because I want to have the right house. I want to have the business around it to help, you know, to support me. I think it makes great financial sense. If I'm in downtown L.A. or New York City, it might not make sense. It might make sense to rent because, the you know, the cost of uh, real estate could be so high. So I think every situation is different. Um, I think the probably the majority of practices where they sit Midwest West Coast probably makes sense to buy your own building. And, and another thing, you're you're in Eagle, Idaho. Obviously, that's not San Francisco or Seattle. Um, how big a factor do you think a lot of success is just demographics? I mean, you know, you you go within a mile of the beach from San Diego to to Monterey to San Fran, and there's a dentist for every 350 people. Then sometimes you'll meet a dentist doing three and a half million. He's a town of five thousand. He's the only dentist. Um, yeah. when, when you're, when you're buying a practice and you're trying to get someone in there, how, what, what are you thinking when you're looking at demographics? How important that is to you? I know, I know you're really familiar in my backyard. I mean, I, I doubt you would go to North Scottsdale. Uh, sure I do. I know wherever you are. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I know North Scottsdale. I mean, every time someone says I went bankrupt, I mean, I mean a third of them are in North Scottsdale. I mean, there's of just course. a dentist they're on just, every corner. Well, they're just chasing it and they just haven't gone. It, you do have to look, you do have to consider that. I mean, if you go, you go and open up your building and there's nobody there, uh, it's going to be very tough to find customers. Uh, so you do need to consider that. Um, again, when we're going out and looking for practices, I'm buying existing practices. I'm not doing startups. So it's a little bit different because I can already see the potential of income. I can see the history of what's there. And I can see how many patients are in the practice. Then I can look around the community and see what's there. I believe that you can set up pretty much whatever you want, considering some factors. And if you implement the right business philosophy, the right service, that you'll definitely go to that practice over time. Um, I've had dentists that have been in prime, prime locations, 
should be killing it. And they're going bankrupt. Why? Because of them. Because of this lack of systems they brought, brought into their practice. So it is important, but I wouldn't chase a practice to, you know, some sticks, some someplace on the sticks where the only, you know, restrooms and outhouse just because you're the only dentist and you hate where you live, but you're going to make a good living. You see what I mean? We got into this profession so we could have that choice of where we want to be. And I think that's something that we shouldn't take away from ourselves. And I tell young dentists all the time, pick where you want to live. Okay. Pick where you want to live. And somewhere around that area, we're going to find a place for you to practice so that your lifestyle and your life outside of your office is just as great as your life inside the office. But if you chase an opportunity that's somewhere you hate, you're going to hate your profession after a time and you're going to hate where you live, live and it's just not going to be good. And you're going to end up surrendering and finally going to someplace you like. So you need to consider both. And, and you know, in my last 30 years, I can name you 10 friends who, you know, live, live where they wanted to live in the suburbs of Phoenix somewhere. But they commuted an hour the wrong way down into town where they, they left their home as a dentist for 2000 They commuted downtown or as a dentist for 400 And whereas some of their friends – commuted out of town oh, down to Maricopa or Eloy or Florence, and the difference between their two economic lives was just day and night, sure, just by sure. commuting the right way from where you want to live from the wrong way. Absolutely. I mean, you want to go where there ain't, so if you're in traffic all day to your location, you know, you just gotta, it's got to make you think, are any of these other cars dentists? Um, in, in your book, uh, Practice Made Perfect, Blueprint for a Successful Dental Business, talk about that book. What is the practice made perfect? What is the blueprint for a successful dental business? Well, this is what I, what I tell my clients. You know, the blueprint, everybody wants the one thing, Howard, and I'm sure you get this a lot yourself. They want that one thing. Tell me what it is, what it is. And the, and the fact is it isn't. What I will say and what I've told every client I've ever worked with, the secret to this business is doing a lot of little things great consistently. And both those things are very important. Doing them great and consistently, and it's little things. It's the fact that I still, at 21 years, still call every patient that I get numb at the end of the day. Now, is that a big major thing that I can implement and tell, tell you what to do? No, but it's probably been the biggest marketing thing I've ever done in my entire practice. Now, can I tell a guy to do that? Will he do it? I don't know. But if he doesn't do it consistently, it's not gonna help his practice. You know, um, just how we do all the little things. It's accumulation of all these little things you do in your practice. And we can, and they're all in the book so you can see it. It's the four stages of case presentation. It's comprehensive diagnosis. It's one of the biggest things, I think, in dentistry. And I, I've uh, mentioned this, I think, on one of the posts, uh, confrontational tolerance. You know, Greg Stanley coined that term years ago. Um, it, it, I think that's a huge problem in our profession right now. Um, and that is a, that is something we need to acknowledge. You know, we come out of some, my dental school experience was great. You know, I went to the University of Pacific. They taught us great. We, I, I think that came with a price because at that time it was the most expensive dental school on the planet, but, um, you know, we got a great education out there. But when I came out, I felt really confident diagnosing dentistry as I, I diagnosed everybody as if they were my family member with no thought in my head about insurance or can they pay, can they, or can they afford it, whatever, because it didn't really matter. I come from the mindset of offer the best and let them figure it out because you don't know where people's values are. But if you create a value for your product, trust me, people will come up for a way to buy that, right? How much, what, what's our credit card debt rate? A, a trillion dollars or something? I mean, it's it, a trillion for, it's a trillion on credit cards and a trillion on student loans. There you go. So people will find a way if you create enough value, but you have to give them the option. I find, I find a lot of clients, um, and dentists, young dentists and even senior dentists will get themselves into ruts. That's where they start to look at things and, and they start to go into diagnosis and they diagnose one crown when the person needs six. And because they're afraid to say you need six crowns. And um, it's, it's a problem. So that's one thing in your practice. You know, um, the, th the three stages of clinical efficiency I mentioned, focus, organization, knowing your outcome. Um, that's a great thing. Um, the presentation triangle, I call it, where, you know, we spend a lot of our dentists, spend a lot of their time diagnosing behind the patient. You know, the patient's in the chair and the dentist and the assistant are talking behind them as they're looking at the computer screen behind them. Oh, well, I coach everybody to get out in front. So we're the, we're the base of that triangle, my assistant my, and myself, and the patient is at that pinnacle or that peak of that triangle. So all our conversation is directed towards them. You want to build value for the product, you need to get that person to understand 
what you are, what you have to offer, and what you are um, helping them uh, 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 see that's in your mouth. You're a doctor, for God's sakes. Okay, your patient comes in, they know does it hurt or does it not hurt, and it doesn't look good or it looks good. That's it. That's all they know. They don't know if it's broken. They don't know if it needs to be fixed. They don't know if bacteria is leaking. So, introduction to the enteral camera. That's another one. I mean, that is the greatest tool in the world. I would, I would choose if somebody said pick between your handpiece and your natural camera, I don't know which one I would do. <laughs> it's that important because people, you know, 80% of people are visual. If you can't show them what you are talking about, then it's just, then it's just uh, Latin that they don't understand and you start throwing about it, M-O-D-O-B's and, and buccal cusps and lingual margins and they don't know what the hell you're talking about. You, sh- you put up a picture of a big silver filling that has, that's breaking down and it's black and you say, what do you think we should do about that? Well, we should fix it. I say, okay, let's fix it. So it's all those little things, Howard. So that, I mean, I've just lifted a few there. I could list a couple hundred. Um, but when you attain to those little things, you create an amazing base of a practice. And you don't have to rush out and try to chase every little thing that's out there. And you don't have to try to be everything to everybody. Um, it can work, and I've proven that over the years. You know, my, uh, you know, um on the nine specialties, the ones that get all the the talk and the attention is you know endo, perio, you know ortho, pedo. They never dental health gets no health, and you know police are supposed to catch bad guys, firemen put out fires. The the thing that keeps me up the most at night is that, or every time an American dentist diagnoses a hundred cavities, they only drill, fill, and bill thirty eight. I mean we we can't even catch half the bad guys. We can't put out half the fires. What did by and, and then then what I, what I don't like about our culture is when everybody talks about, well, what is a great dentist? It's always some crazy, I trim my own dyes, I know occlusion, I went to the Panky Institute. It's like, dude, you went to the Panky Institute and six out of ten cavities walk out your door. You never even remove the decay. And, and they, they talk about all the bonding agents. They debate what's better, amalgam or composites. Like, dude, you don't even clean out the infection six out of ten times, and you call yourself a great doctor. So give my homie some advice on how instead of just – removing 38% of the decay, maybe they can get to half if they well, I think, I think it's, it's, it better. I, I, and, and that is a real problem in our profession, a real problem that I see almost every day. It's shocking when I see a new patient come into my office and they had just seen their previous dentist six months ago and they're loyal. They're there every six months and they need five to $10,000 worth of restorative dentistry. Not, they're not, not, not um, aesthetic dentistry, just Restorative dentistry that's just been overlooked because, again, they fall into that pattern of confrontational tolerance. It gets the best of them. They just cannot for the life of them tell their patients they've known for 20 years that, God forbid, the crown they put on 20 years ago is now failing. You know, it does. I can't coach a person to stand close enough to their toothbrush. If they don't brush them, they're going to fail. Your natural ones fail, right? So I would tell dentists that you need to change your mindset of when it comes, when you're diagnosing your treatment and when you're presenting your treatment plans, I do it this way. I go into every case, every 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 new patient exam. I look at it as I want to, my one sole job because they're paying me for an exam is to tell them everything that needs to be done. Not a few things, not a five things. Everything that's to get them to oral, great oral health. And how I set myself up for that is I ask permission. So, and that's a great way because I get in front of them, I introduce myself, I build rapport with my patient. This is a new patient I haven't seen before, and I know that I'm going to potentially have to tell them they're, they're going to need a lot of dental work, so I want to get in rapport first. I think that's very important. Once I'm in rapport with them and get in a rapport, it's, it's in the book, which I could spend a couple of days on talking on that, that subject alone. But once I'm in rapport with them, then I'm going to ask them a very simple question. Is it okay? that I lean you back and I'm going to look at everything in your mouth. Is it okay if I tell you things that I think need to be corrected in order for you to have perfect oral health? Well, in 21 years, I've never had a patient say no. Uh, Just only look at the ones that are really bad, doc, and and don't tell me the rest. Of course they're going to say yes. So now what I've done is I've positioned myself to become a liaison to them instead of them being defensive thinking I'm trying to make my next boat payment. Okay, so I, I step back, and when I diagnose, I diagnose everything as if it was 
uh, in my mouth, my friend's mouth, whatever that I, 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 I give one diagnosis. There's not a hierarchy of diagnosis. You know, you come in driving the, you know, the Bentley, you don't get one diagnosis and you come in uh, driving the Jetta, you get another diagnosis. You all get the same and that's the way it should be. So commit, dentists should commit themselves to that mindset, knowing that I'd rather tell, you know what the most powerful thing when you do that, when you diagnose everything, and I give them a treatment plan, okay, and I break it down into sections so it's not overwhelming, okay, because I don't want somebody to get overwhelmed, when they get overwhelmed, they don't do anything, um, but I honestly don't really care if they do the treatment or not, because I did my job. What they paid me for was to give them a complete exam of what, uh, diagnosing their oral health, what needs to be completed. Now. I did, this is the one, most powerful thing I was going to get to. It's, there's nothing more powerful when you do that, when a patient calls you up on a Saturday afternoon and goes, hey, doc, I just broke a tooth. I bit down on a nut and I just broke a tooth. And I look into their chart and I go, oh, yeah, Bob, I diagnosed that last year. Now I look like a, a, a freaking genius, right? But if it's not on that and they've been coming every six months and they go, oh, I bit down and I broke it, how come you didn't know? There's a part of them that goes, well, how come you didn't know that? Because, well, I was afraid to tell you. So I guarantee you, a patient will, I have never met a patient that would say, why won't you tell me? Because they all want to know. Nobody wants to hear it, but they all need to know and they want to know. So if you're going to charge it for an exam, give them a complete exam and commit to that. Yeah, I know. I was telling a patient the other day, she goes, uh, you know, her, uh, her friend had, ju- had died of a heart attack and he, he had just had a physical a month ago, and the doctor said he was okay. She just kept harping on it. I said, why are you harping on that? Why didn't you harp on He had just left Circle K that morning with a new pack of cigarettes. You know, why, <laughs> why, are, why are you harping yeah. on the doctor a month ago when he's gone to Circle K <clears throat> for six 30 times since? Um, crazy, crazy. So, so, you know, looking for guy, you know, looking for treatment. There's plenty of treatment out there. Guys that are going bankrupt just aren't looking. I mean, it's, it's there. You just have to have enough. You have to set yourself and your team up to every, hold everybody accountable so you diagnose everybody to the highest degree as if it was your brother or sister. Okay, but uh, explain again. Um, I think a lot of these young kids who are older like us who knew Greg Stanley back in the day. We, had, we podcast interview him, Confrontational Intolerance. Explain what Confrontational Intolerance is. Confrontational Intolerance, in, in essence, is stepping up to that voice in you that doesn't want to – you know, this is the thing. Okay, I go in and I, nobody wants to know they, they need a root canal build up and crown, okay, or they need a new crown, or they need a filling. Nobody wants to hear that. But you but you have a right as a dentist to tell them that. Okay? So that confrontational tolerance is stepping up when it's uncomfortable and telling them exactly what they need and showing them and building value for what they need. Okay, versus your hygienist finds an open margin on a crown, brings you in, she's done a great job building value for it, and because you're too darn scared to face that confrontation, having a confrontation possibly, I say confrontation not as two people button heads, it's that, con- it's that confrontation of the dentist feeling rejected because the patient is disappointed with their diagnosis. Well, every diagnosis is going to be disappointing. I don't want to have anything myself done, but if I need it, I at least want to have the opportunity to make that decision for myself. So confrontation tolerance is when you see something and you're at the end of the day and you see an open margin, you take the time and you fully diagnose it and you present that treatment to that patient and not push it under the rug and go, "Ah, I think it's okay. It'll be good next time. They come back six months from now or they miss a hygiene recare cycle. They come back a year from now and now you're doing a root canal. That's the vision you have to have in your head that if you're not diagnosing like that, that you're potentially now causing this patient an an enormous amount of harm. And that's not what we got in this profession to do. But, but these guys were selected into the profession because she got A's in calculus, physics, and geometry. So she has low confrontational tolerance to tell the patient you got 10 cavities. But she also has low confrontational tolerance to tell the assistant and hygienist what she expects of them. So you're talking about raise your confrontational tolerance, tell the patient exactly what they need. Give them, at what advice would you give them to raise their confrontational tolerance of, of leading their staff? Or what leadership skills? Well, you're, you're, that's a great point. If they, if they lack in confrontational tolerance with their team and with their patients, boy, I'll tell you what, that's going to be tough for practice, that practice to, to survive. So if they, start to, if, they, if they know that's a weakness for them, 
Go out and get some help. Find a consultant. There's plenty of them out there. Find something you enjoy. Listen to your, you know, your your virtues of uh, of, of dentistry. You know, I mean, there's there's plenty of things out there that they can start to build on that. Again, uh, what I said, what you know, realize your weaknesses and go out there and try to fix them because you have to be the leadership. And you have to be the leader. When we talk about when I talked about, you know, finding practices with Triumph Dental and setting our dentists up. What I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not only teaching them the business practice management, how to run this business, but I'm setting them up to be a leader of that business. Because at the end of the day, you know, their, the, their financial health is on the line for whether or not this business succeeds or not, not the hygienist, not the assistant, or not the front office. So don't allow them to be the leaders. You have to be the leaders. You have to set the tone of what you expect in your practice. And if we go into confrontational tolerance and you as a leader set that up, that this is how we diagnose, this is, and it becomes the culture of your practice. And then it changes everything in your practice. So if you're not good, go find the people that will make you good. So, um, Dentaltown, uh, our last year's goals was to get the, the online CE, which is on the desktop PC, to get it on the app. And we got it up in, on the Samsung th- several months ago, and we just got up on the uh, iOS iPhone, and that's been huge. The next thing we're going to do this year is get the classified ads uh, on the, on the um, uh, smartphone on the Dentaltown app, too. Um, about 40,000 dentists have downloaded the Dentaltown app. The classified is one of the hottest things. So when you're looking to buy a practice, are you looking at – the classified ads on Dentaltown. If sure. you're if you're looking for an associate, are you utilizing that? Because about a thousand yep. dentists a day go to those classifieds. Yeah. Well, yep. so tell tell us. So if I got older dentists that are selling your product, tell them talk to them right now. You're talking to thousands of dentists. If they're older, thinking about selling, tell them what you're looking for. And if they're younger dentists that want to do this, um, triumph-dental.com. T- talk about because you you have two customers. You have sellers, buyers. Be sure. specific what you're looking for. Sure. So in, in regards to practices we're looking for, and it works out really great, we're looking for great private dental practices um, that um, have room for growth, um, that want that want to leave a legacy behind, because I believe every dentist that spends 20 or you know 30 years in their practice treating their community wants to exit in dignity and wants to bring somebody else into that practice that's going to represent their legacy very well. Okay, I think that's really important, and we can provide that because the dentists we bring in and transition into this seller's uh, business, we're going to make sure they're successful. We're make sure they're doing all the things. We're not turning them into um, a high volume, medium to low quality practice. We're going to keep that same reputation in their practice that they've always had. So, uh, sellers don't have to. We're not corporate dentistry. I'm not. We're, we're just a, basically a broker that brings two people together and teaches the second one how to succeed in that business. Um, the, for the for the dentists who want to get in, um, it's just a, it's just a, it's a turnkey way to, to to get in and and not have to um, start knocking on doors and find an associateship that you know they tell you there'll be a partnership in two years and you finally agree on the price and the price is double that it was two years ago because the guy doesn't really want to sell anymore and it just doesn't work out or you get stuck in corporate dentistry and now you don't know what to do. This just gives you a platform to do that. So when we go out and find those practices, yeah, I'm accessing dental town all the time because there's there's amazing practices on there. In fact, I was just I just found a practice up in Spokane yesterday off your site um, that we're going to probably close on next week and, and bring a guy into. Great practice. You know, it, you got to sift through a lot of them because they're not all, they don't all meet the criteria. But, you know, I like practices uh, for our clients that are somewhere in that six to $800,000 gross production that we can build from there and we build, bring them in and, and set them up. So it's, a, it's truly a win-win for the and self you, and, the, and the incoming devs. Are you mostly buying them from brokers or are you the broker? Or, or, I mean, most of these practices that are selling, are they going the, through a broker? Most, most practices that we're buying are coming, they're, they're listed by dental practice brokers. You know, I'm just, I'm just a, a middle person that's bringing the dentist in and helping. I'm really representing the dentist. I'm re- representing this young dentist as, as fi- helping him find a do great you, practice. Do, do you personally buy the practice and then later sell it to the dentist? We do both. We do both. So if we get a client that's great, we can't get them financed. Maybe they're too young at a dental school. They don't have enough uh, history in the dental profession. We'll buy that. 
and we'll coach them up. And in 36 months, we'll share in that upside uh, when it comes time to turn that practice over to them. And then we help them get financed at that point. Um, there's some that come out and they really, you know, they've been in the military. They don't have hardly any debt at all. And we can get them financed right away. And then we just continue to coach them for those three years to make sure all those little things that we talked about are implemented in the practice. And we set them up for a great career. So there's a couple different ways we can go about doing it. And a lot of dentists always are asking on Dentaltown, what met, how do you value a dentalist? I mean, in economic theory, the value is actually whatever someone is willing to pay for it. So if sure. someone will give you a dollar for it, it's worth a dollar. If no one will give you a dollar, it's not. What, what, what metrics are you looking at? When you go buy a practice and you buy it for a dollar, what made it a dollar and not $2 or 50 cents for you? That's a good question, and every, every I, I kind of go back to every practice is different, okay? Um, and it depends on the location. You know, in Boise, Idaho, uh, practices sell for premium because of that it becomes supply and demand. You know, if I was to put this practice, my practice I have today, up for sale, it would sell probably in a week. Whereas a practice in downtown Los Angeles might take a, a year to sell to find the right guy. So it really depends on that thing first, is the supply and demand, what do we have in regards to that practice? I look at practices that I could uh, that we could purchase, and it generally ends up being as a as a nutshell. I mean, I'm looking at the equipment, how how good a quality that equipment is, because are we going to have to come into that practice and take a lot of capital expenditure to upgrade the equipment so it's actually tasteful and it looks like it's up to date, um, and, uh, or is it already is that already done? So that'll that'll contribute some value. But I would I would say it's somewhere practices are as a whole around the Northwest where we really focus is somewhere between. Oh, I'd say 70 to 80 percent of their last uh, 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 three years uh, gross collections. Is Eagle the capital of Boise? Of, uh, Boise, is. Boise is. Eagle's just a little suburb. It's right next to Boise. You wouldn't know if you transferred oh, into it's, it. It's a it's suburb just, of Boise. Yes, exactly. Oh, okay. It transfers right into it. And by the way, I would say that most of our listeners have probably never been to Idaho. I, I don't think it's well-traveled, but I, I think that is one of the – most beautiful states I've ever seen in my life. I remember I took all four of my boys up there uh, in an RV, uh -huh. and uh, holy gamole! Because when you're in Phoenix, you think of vacations going north when it's hot. Right. If you live up north, you think of vacations as going to the Caribbean when it's February in your place. So, but man, I, I, I've always wanted to figure out how I could live in Idaho or Alaska during the summer and Phoenix during the winter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and the summer's beautiful up here. In fact, I was just down in your end of the woods. Uh, uh, last weekend, and it is gorgeous down there right now. <laughs> yeah, to be down there. It, it is truly amazing, but but I, I do think Idaho might be. And there's a couple of states that I think are the most beautiful that no one ever talks about. One is Idaho. One is Arkansas. I mean, no. I mean, have I've you been to been Arkansas? Oh no, no, I've never been there. I went trout fishing on the. It was the White River, the Brown River. I forgot which one it was. And uh, holy gamole, I mean, just stunningly gorgeous. Um, yeah. So so last last question. Um, talk more about a lot of. A big fan of these podcasts are young. I mean, just young kids devour these podcasts. Seems like a uh, – yeah. so talk, they're probably afraid to go see – they probably have no idea if they can get credit at a bank. They're, they're, so what, what, what is it like for a kid coming out of school uh, to get a big bank uh, to finance them to a bad practice? I mean, are, do, is there, you know, is there it, credit for them or is that – Well, it depends. It depends. It depends on you know their past history. I don't know what kind of debt they have coming out of undergrad. You know, Some of these guys are – are really heavily loaded out of debt. And that's where we step in and we can help finance that practice. What's heavily loaded mean? Medical oh, marijuana course. or over? Well, some of the LDS debt? guys I've seen, uh, you know, they're they're getting close to a million dollars in debt. They're coming out of school a million in debt. Well, not a million in debt with school debt, but they they're they're they've got maybe a hundred thousand dollars in undergrad. They've got two to four hundred thousand dollars in dental school debt, and then they rush out and buy a house. And yeah. so they're, they're, they're let capacity, you know, and that's uh, the, and that's the, what I call the, the, that's what I call an LDS slave unicorn. You hire that guy. He'll right. work 12 hours a day, six <laughs> days a week for a he decade without he's blinking. Got kids. He's got four yeah. kids. He's got, he has to. And really, I mean, you know, would you, would you call him an indentured servant? Because <laughs> remember in America where they used to, they used to pay for your boat ride over here, but you had to work on the farm for seven years. Remember that? That's, the indentured yeah, servants? Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So young know, dentists need to get that their their goal and their accomplishment, as it great as it is getting out of dental school, is just the start. 
It's just the beginning. Now you have, now you get to at least be paid for what you were doing, but the work ethic doesn't go down. You're not getting a vacation just because you graduated from dental school. Now you, now's the years you need to really work your butt off and really establish your platform. Uh, you know, I don't work three days a week and do a million five because I was lazy in the first decade of my career. The reason I get to do that is because I worked my butt off in that first decade of my practice. So now everything seems simple because the culture's simple. The systems are in integrated to the point where I wouldn't even know how to get rid of them. So I would say, young Dennis, you know, uh, de decide what you really want out of this profession and go get it. Be willing to work your butt off and go get it and, you know, uh, enjoy all the benefits this profession has because it's, it's many. Uh, my last uh, um, question to you is uh, um, when you're coaching a young kid, um, you know, they, there's so many mixed media messages. Some of them believe that, you know, well, if I'm going to be successful, I, I'm, I'm going to need to learn how to surgically place implants or I'm going to learn how have to do short term ortho or I got to become a sleep medicine doctor or blah, blah. blah. I and mean, the list is forever. Do, do you coach these kids? Is some of that true or can you just be successful just doing restorative dentistry? Absolutely. Yeah. You don't have to follow those paths. If you, if you enjoy sleep medicine, then kind of go get it, you know, but then you're going to, you're going to succeed at it because you really enjoy it, but don't do it because you think it's the next marketing thing. Or you think it's going to bring new patients to the door and you hate doing it. And in this profession, you need to pick some core things that you're really darn good at and do those really, really well. You know, it cracks me up when guys don't go out and spend $20,000 on a surgical endo microscope, get all the rotary, everything is laid out, and I look at their, um, I look at what they did last year in endos, and they did four. Yeah. I and I'm know. like, why would you do that? And you I did know. 130 crowns, and you've got they'll, hand pieces that are old. They'll go know? to six weeks of the Panky Institute to learn occlusion. I'll say, what percent of your revenue last year was from occlusion or TMJ? And they say, less than 1%. So it's, less than 1%, so you go spend a month and a half in an institute. Exactly. Like That's all I'm saying. Now. So, yeah, and my message gets turned around on me all the time. I mean, if I see a hard friend quote, it's usually just straight ass backwards. <laughs> I say, get the business down, make money, get rich. And then if you want to buy toys, cat cams, lasers, learn occlusion, sleep mess, and knock yourself out, I think the profession has a different. I think they think they have to do these things to get out of debt and be profitable. And it's exactly the reverse. I, I, my final question, we're, we're uh, over time, uh, but I'm very – I think you might be the only one who gets my question on this. So you look at the um, the Clear Choice uh, uh, founders in uh, Colorado and the oral surgeon Old Jensen, where when they built those uh, implant centers, mm -hmm. they they just did the business, the marketing, all that. But as far as the actual person to place the implants, they would just pay some oral surgeon or some periodontist fly in, load them all up. What do you think's a better just business? Not your love, your passion. If you're born for sinus lifts, I get it, Tatum Hill. But for just the business, what do you think's better? To just sit there and load up all your implant cases one day a week and have a periodontist or oral surgeon from the next town come over and do them for a percent or to pay for you yourself to go to the courses, the institutes, the drills, the learning, la, 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 and get yourself up to speed 100 or – You already know where I'm going to answer this one. <laughs> but, 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 but when I say it, I was like, ah, rah, rah, rah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to – they hear I, I'm a 49er. I think, I think the, the exact example you just described, I would I would uh, educate myself on building value for implants, and I would schedule them, and I'd bring my, my periodontist in, and he'd place them all in one day, and I'd be done. Why go out and – to to do – even to do mini implants, there's a big investment in just stuff you've got to do, and you're going to do four a year. So why not just uh, eliminate that part of it, build value for it, keep that practice production in your office, but pay somebody else to come in. It's going to do a better job than you would anyways. And what's, funny, was, and what's funny is those, those implant centers, is they knew the local oral surgeon or periodontist wouldn't do it. But, man, they can sure fly one in on Southwest Airlines from the next town over. Right. I mean, right. you could get 100 different ones from Seattle to jump over the Cascades and come do it in Spokane. Right. And you're not going to, you know, and if you need someone in Seattle, just find someone in Spokane. Yeah. Um, and you should be thinking about that same, that same uh, scenario with root canals and stuff. If you don't enjoy doing them and you're just sending those stuff out, your patient, your patient, if you have rapport with that patient, they want to stay in your office. They want, they feel comfortable with you. So if you can have another dentist and they're in your office having that procedure done and you're making a little bit business wise, it makes sense. 
but customer service wise, it makes a heck of a lot of sense. So I, I like that, and we we do some of that. So. And that's my motto. I mean, build relationships. Don't build teeth. Con concentrate on mental health, not oral health. And if you can get 100%. the mental health of the patient down and build a relationship, anybody, you can bring someone in to fix the teeth. But, yes. hey, dude, seriously, uh, I've been your biggest fan forever. I just think you're a role model from A to Z. I know so many people that know you, of you. Um, everybody, you're, you're just the man, and it was just a complete honor uh, that you spent an hour with me today. Thank you. I really appreciate it, Howard. Uh, and, and uh uh, thanks for having me on. It's been awesome. With your 49er connections, do you think you can get me on the Arizona Cardinals team? I'll just I'll, I'll just, <laughs> just, I'll just, be, I'll know, just I'll, be a water boy. No, no, I did. You just you just finished uh, Iron Man, didn't you? Uh, I've done one every year since I turned 50. I've done three Iron Man. Well, good. hey, so you, that should get you a spot. I don't know where we're going to put you on the field, but on the roster. My, but, uh, my goal is to someday be the oldest, fattest Iron Man that ever lived. That's my goal. <laughs> it's a great goal. <laughs> All right, buddy. Thanks so much for your time.